Good morning. Good morning. We're back. Welcome to the Morning Light Bible Study. This is Russ and Kitty Walden back after one month traveling in ministry. And we really want to thank those of you that hosted us. Those of you that prayed for us, Amen. we had several of you that, uh, the supporters of our ministry that contacted us and said they'd be praying, they would be fasting for the purposes of God to be made uh, strongly known in the meetings that we had in London, in Zurich, outside of Zurich in Belfast, outside of Belfast, and also in northern England, in uh, Barnard Castle, to the, that was to the west of Newcastle upon Tyne. And I just have to say that you know when people are praying. Amen. Because everywhere we went there was an uptick in expectation there was a liberty to speak the word uh, the the people as we connected with those and the very we did two types three types of meetings we did one-on-one -on -one meetings we did small groups and we did small conferences and and in all of the meetings we were warmly received enthusiastically received and people <laughs> were were hungry and and there was liberty to minister uh, a real spirit of revival. You know, here in the States, looking at Western Europe, uh, the consensus uh, has been that uh, there isn't a real spirit of revival in, in Europe. But I want to say that was not our experience. Yeah. We really felt the connection. Thank God you, was Lord. in the house. Uh, lives were changed. The people, so many, so many testimonies of people saying, you just don't know the difference that you made. Both in, in people's individual lives, we met people that were struggling, people whose lives and ministries were stagnant, they were needing breakthrough, and out of their own mouth testified that our visit uh, on assignment from God. It's not something we did just, uh, you know, my dad talks about preacher's itch, you know, where you know you just got to go do something uh, just so you can uh, make your voice heard. And quite frankly, as the strong demand that is always upon our ministry, that is just one thing that, that we don't have a need to do. We're not looking for another place to preach, I promise you. <laughs> but we'll go anywhere that the Holy Ghost directs and uh, particularly God really spoke to his uh, prophet the prophetic significance of his purposes over Switzerland over uh, England Northern Ireland when we were in Northern Ireland uh, we connected a friend of our host our host hostess was uh, uh, Anne McCormick. Anne McCormick. Hi, and, Anne. Hello, mm -hmm. Anne. And, and her friend Graham uh, drove us around most of the time that we were there. And Graham shared with me, actually shared a book with me about the Celtic roots of Christianity in Western Europe. And one of the things that the book that he shared with me talked about is the ancient Celts referred to the Holy Spirit not as a dove, but as a wild goose. And I'll be frank with you, I have a hard time even talking about that without just feeling just choked up in myself. The emotions just come right up to the surface because uh, the Lord just kept telling me that the wild goose of the Holy Spirit was taking flight over Western Europe. And, and we, we saw it when we met in uh, Barnard Castle with our uh, our host was uh, Eunice uh, Brennan, and uh, we ministered to many people uh, 
one on one and also uh, in a meeting there, the meeting hall in the Methodist Church in Barnard Castle, uh, England. And uh, the spirit of revival was so strong. It's been a long time since I was shouted down trying to bring a message Amen. that God had given. But the people, the place was packed. The people were beside themselves as the word of the Lord came forth. And, uh, uh, and it was a message that was reaching back to the very roots of Christianity in, in Britain and in, in the British Isles. And what a powerful spirit of revival was was present and we're we're here to bring that back to the to the states because God's spirit knows no national boundary Amen. what he does for one people he does for another and, and we just pray for you we have, we uh, one thing i learned i, I spent many years uh, at a spiritual location <laughs> That we're going to talk about today in Exodus chapter 3. When Moses went to the wilderness. Emphasis on the word wild. Uh, the wilderness. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I've done my time in the wilderness. But I also learned when there was no revival streams flowing. I learned how to stir up the streams of God in my own heart and life. And when I was spent 15 years on the backside of a spiritual desert and couldn't find a revival stream if I if I looked for one but yet in my soul I had revival in my soul I had what I read about in the Cane Ridge revival what I read about in the Great Awakening what I read about in the Azusa Street revivals in the 1950s healing revivals that as I studied those historical revivals and I know there's you hear that a lot. Ministers will say, well, don't look to the revivals of times past. Uh, but you know, the Bible talks about don't forget the ancient, uh, the ancient landmarks. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's like whenever we, we live in an area that's prone to flooding and we can drive down by the lake at the base. We live on the base of a 200-foot bluff and at the base there is uh, Lake Tanicomo. And which is formed by they've dammed up the White River and there have been flooding and we can go down and look at underneath bridges and we can see the high water marks where the water has been in times past and I can tell you this we need to remember the high water marks of revival so that we don't forget that we allow those revivals to testify to themselves lest we get such a diminished idea of what God is doing that we no longer hope for a uh, revival that changes nations, that changes lives, changes communities, and changes culture. Uh, God is a God of transformation. He does not compromise uh, with lukewarmness. He does not compromise with uh, a mixture of the world and a mixture of the things of God. His base nature, according to Isaiah 11, it talks about the seven spirits of God. Well, the very first one is the Spirit of the Lord. It is God's nature to take over anywhere He goes. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can look around you, and it seems like the enemy is getting the upper hand politically, culturally, uh, in our generation, in our younger generation. But that is not the testimony from heaven's perspective. And I'm here to say that revival is available. Uh, what is revival? Uh, revival is a return of the level of visitation of the Spirit of God that obscures previous high water marks Amen. where we see in our day Amen. a level of revival that has no peer. This has happened many times in the in the history of the church. Probably the most profound was during the Azusa Street Revival that has completely changed culture, has changed Christian, Christianity as a culture, is different because of the Azusa Street outpouring. And uh, I know that revival. I know that revival in my soul. So what we we believe is going to happen when we were coming home the father said um don't forget branson 
And that's the city we live in. And, and we've known uh, for years about revival this and revival that is destined to come. And we believe that about Branson. And we want to be a part of that. Every one of you listening have revival in your soul. If you're hungry for the word of God, you are a candidate <coughs> for revival. Pardon me. And um, it, it's the embers of revival are burning, and we want to see God just blow on the winds of it. We've gotten word through our son-in-law, Mark Davis, and Nixa, there's a church in revival now, and things are busting out everywhere we are connecting with people who are loving God and looking for Him. God is doing that. So just ask the Father how you can be a part of revival in your city if it starts in your house, and it has to because it'll start in your home, in your heart. And you can be the ignition switch. You can be, you know, you flick one of those big to start a, a to light a cigarette, I guess, or light a fire. Just ask God to light your fire with this fire revival, revival, because it is burning, and He wants to do something in your very location. Um, and for my part, I just want to say, God left a beautiful testimony in Europe, and and he, uh, we were known as some of the most generous people in restaurants and hotels. Um, the, they said the average person doesn't ever tip. And, uh, and it, I said, it's our custom. We are a generous people because we serve a generous God. And they were like tripping over themselves saying, why are you doing that? And it's just to give, just to serve, and just to show an example. So I want you, uh, from, from my part and Russ's heart, we had a beautiful experience. And we believe it's just the beginning. We've been invited to come back. God knows when that will happen, but um, it was a wonderful and positive experience. And for those of you who've been asking on the internet, Deacon's great. <laughs> so, as I was in the early hours of this morning, I was thinking about the ancient Celts and the wild goose of the Holy Spirit, and where we live above. Lake Tanicomo, that's one of the favorite things I really like about this area, is when the geese are here. They will, uh, early in the morning, as soon as it's light, just as soon as the light be level begins to change, there is a pair of geese that, now I've done this for years, that fly down the White River about two feet off the water, and they're crying out for their flock. And the first time I heard them, it was one goose. And then uh, uh, later it was two. And then we moved away from this area for a while and came back. And now in our new home, when we first got here, the geese were flying. And it wasn't just one goose, but it was many that were crying out. Thank you, Lord. The whole flock. Thank you, Father. And I thought about the Celts. Why would they call the Holy Spirit the wild goose? Because it's that cry of the goose, like the shepherd who says, My sheep hear my voice. Mm -hmm. It's the cry of the Holy Spirit. And, you know, there are many reasons why God's people don't come together. And there are so many things that keep us from having unity, keep us from flowing together in brotherhood and in love. But, but there is one thing that unites us. And one thing that unites those geese is, is the cry of that leader. The cry of that goose that brings together, ultimately brings together the flock. And then I, I just thought of the ancient Celts when they looked up to the heavens and they'd see that V formation and that goose flying. And they compared that to the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Amen. That uh, we are, we're on our way to somewhere. He's, those geese fly all over the world. And wherever they, they fly, they're, they're fruitful. And they, they bring forth their created purpose. And likewise, the cry of, of God. It's the, it's the call of the Holy Spirit. Like yes, John the Baptist says, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. And, uh, oh and I just, in my heart this morning, I was saying, I don't want to hear that cry. I yes. want to hear the call of God. Not the call of man. No. Not the, not the soup du jour. Not the... The soup of the day, not what's what's uh, titillating uh, men's hearts or or uh, tickling their ears today, but what is the overarching cry of the Holy Spirit over the land that that drowns out, that causes you to filter out what the world is saying, to filter out the urgency of circumstances in your life, and causes you to realize like those geese. When that call comes, God programs something in those geese that they're drawn to that cry, and when they lift their wings and join with that leader, 
with that with that one that's that's leading they are a part of something larger than themselves Amen. there is a corporate purpose of god in the earth and you can be a part of it but it is going to require spreading your wings and allowing the call of god the call of the holy spirit to draw you out of all of the stuff that was to keep you bound and keep you isolated and keep you uh, turned away doing your own thing yes, and, yes, and allowing the, the tyranny of the urgent to drown out that, that, that regal call to mount up with wings as eagles and begin to follow after uh, the Spirit of God. I just pray that we would all begin to hear that cry. I believe in all of the stuff that's going on culturally in the world today where it, it seems on a cultural level that the, that the church and the, the standards of God are being assaulted and coming to failure in many, in many areas culturally, politically uh, but yet in the midst of that uh, God reigns over all of that and there is a cry going forth in the land and I've heard the Lord say that to me and it kind of fits uh, with the idea of the goose. God's told me years ago and he repeats it to me quite often. He says, I'm not coming down there to you. Amen. You're going to have to come up here to me. Yes, Lord. We're going to have to, uh, when we, we're going to be doing a, a conference. I don't know when, but that's one of the things God spoke to me about a conference that we're going to uh, have one day called Come Up Higher. And just like that goose, when he doesn't come down to collect all of the geese uh, that are scattered across the earth uh, within the, the sound of his voice, he doesn't, he doesn't spiral down and say, now come on, let's go. Mm -hmm. You know, he's already done that. He already came down. Yeah, yeah. He already did that. He doesn't have to do it again. Uh, he's, that, when that goose flies, he's not going to come down there to gather you up. He's calling you to come up there to Him. If you want to be with Him, we've got to rise up and, and follow Him and join Him where He is, seated with Christ in heavenly places. As you're sharing all that, honey, I, over and over again in my spirit, I keep hearing the Lord say, folks, sanctify yourselves. Sanctify your own self, Keith Moore would say in another message he brought about submit your own self. But I hear the Father saying, sanctify yourself. This is the time that you're not going to be looking to another to tell you what it means to be separated, sanctified, set apart unto the Lord. Nobody else can draw that conclusion for you that we as individuals, and I'm speaking to myself, we have to hear from heaven and say, um, I, I hear that there's a grace now for the sanctification of our lives. The Father says, in times past you've asked me, but there's been so many distractions Distractions. You've asked me for help to sanctify you, but this is now the time my spirit is poured out, the Lord said, that I'm going to give you instruction and direction that's going to come easily, and it's going to be like a spoonful of sugar that helps that medicine go down. The Father says, I am here to aid and uh, rescue you. I am come alongside of you, and I'm going to give you the courage, and I'm going to give you the instruction, but I'm going to give you the strength to obey. Every circumstance that I speak into, he said, just obey me, but sanctify yourself by the grace of God in Jesus name Amen. so let's begin with Exodus chapter 3 and Kitty if you just read about the first five verses wherever the natural stopping place is and okay. then we'll go from there now Moses kept the flock of Jethro his father-in-law the priest of Midian and he led the flock to the back side of the desert and came to the mountain of God called Horeb and the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Draw not nigh hither. Put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. So Moses has, he was born and brought out of the bulrushes into the house of Pharaoh. He was raised up to be a prince of Pharaoh. He could have been Pharaoh, but he had a heart. He knew he was called for the salvation of his people, and he promptly goes out and uh, does a crash and burn, killing the Egyptian 
He's rejected by his own people. Uh, he's pursued by Pharaoh. And he runs to the desert. And what does he do? Now, so many ministers have done that. They feel like they have come to failure. Uh, they've stepped out in their youth. They've seen some successes. They've seen God do some things. But due to circumstances beyond their control, sometimes uh, things that you know, there may be someone listening and you've done some stupid things. And you've destroyed your own ministry by lack of wisdom and by mistakes and errors and outright sins. But I want you to notice Moses is on the back side of the desert, the back side of the wilderness, but notice what he's, do he's doing. He's keeping a flock. He's got a sense of responsibility. God put a shepherd's heart uh, in this, this man. He, 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 the DNA of God on the inside of him was to take care of the flock of God, and uh, he promptly uh, completely messed that up and missed God's timing more than anything else. And uh, now he's on the backside of the desert, but the DNA of God is still working itself out in his life. You know, I spent uh, my early uh, adulthood for 20 years plus uh, ministering, uh, pastoring, being a full-time pastor. It was really my, my first uh, adult job that I ever had was being a full-time pastor. I loved being a pastor. It's what I wanted. What I enjoyed, I never saw myself doing anything else. And then through a set of circumstances that I thought would lead to promotion, I actually found myself uh, out of the ministry. And I was working for a denominational headquarters. I thought, well, I've come into my own. I was not just overseeing one church. I was overseeing many churches and hundreds of ministers. But I, reali but I realized that the dynamic of the flock of God was not there. It was like a religious bureaucracy that I was a part of. And it became empty and, and became a, a frustration in my soul because the heart of a, of a pastor that was beating within me uh, did not was not finding expression. And then the Lord told me to resign. And uh, I said, well, I wanted to go back to into pastoring a church. And there were two churches that were available in our organization. And the Lord said, no, I don't want you to do that. I didn't understand that. I thought maybe I was going through a time of transition. As I'm sure when Moses went into the wilderness, he might have thought it was just going to be a time of transition turned into 40 years. Mm -hmm. And when I, I, the Lord told me to go to a small town here in Missouri and open a business. And I thought, well, it's just a short time of transition and then I'll get back to doing what God called me to do. Well, it turned into 15 years. And when I saw that, I thought God was mad at me. And I found out really what he was really doing was bringing me into the very center of his will. Amen. But I had to do some time <clears throat> on Mount Horeb. I had to do some time on the backside of the wilderness. I love this confirmation in verse 2 when he saw, he looked and saw, but he beheld the fire. And that's what I was addressing earlier. We we are, as believers listening today, we're beholding the fire in our spirit. We've got eyes to see. We've got ears to hear. So we're beholding the fire. But the important key was the next verse. And Moses said, now I will turn aside and see this great sight. And he pulled himself aside. He, he set himself apart to see. It's interesting, too, that this fire, it describes, you find this fire throughout the scripture. The first time we saw this fire was in Genesis chapter 15, when God had told uh, Abraham and had a major setback. In Genesis 14, he had, he had conquered the cities of the plain. He had conquered several armies with just miraculously with 318 men, and everything around him was in the palm of his hand. He had... He had come into possession of the, of the territory as far as he could see, north, south, east, and west. And then God shows up and says, I want you to give all that back. <laughs> and, he, and he gave it all back. And the first thing God told him in Genesis 15, the very next thing God told him, he said, Fear not, Abraham. I am your shield. I'm going to protect you. And I am your exceeding great reward. And that word was salary. Mm -hmm. He had the wealth of ten cities in his hand. And God said, Give it all back. And, uh, and you can imagine, he's concerned about, number one, 
the people around him think he's out of his mind and they know he's, first of all, they know he's dangerous. Second of all, they know he's vulnerable. And so he was afraid and he was concerned. And God shows up and caused him to fall into a trance in this, in this called it a smoking furnace and burning lamp, mm-hmm. came down and ratified a sacrifice that Abraham prepared. And they call that a Christophany, which was a pre- Calvary manifestation of Jesus, manifestation of Christ. That that fire, column of fire that came down was the same column of fire, the same anointing that came upon Jesus when he came out of the water at his baptism. And he received the Christ anointing and went out and was tempted of the enemy and then came back in the power of the Spirit, raising the dead, casting out devils, cleansing the lepers. And then we fast forward and now Moses is experiencing the same fire is in the bush that that burns and it's not consumed and it said he turned aside to see what was going on kitty says anything that makes you do a double take pray to interpret uh just like i when i sat here we used to live across the river i can see the place where we used to live from up on this bluff and I would get up early in the morning. I'd open our sliding door just enough to hear those geese. When the light would break, let me tell you something. When God is about to do something, when light breaks, you're going to hear the call of God. And I'd hear those geese call. And something would just grip me. I would, it would, I'd be overcome with emotion to hear that. Anything that makes you do a double take, you better pray to interpret. God Amen. is saying something. Amen. God Amen. is doing something. And Moses said, uh, turned aside and then you could fast forward again to when they bring the children of Israel out of Egypt and it was this same column of fire that led them through the wilderness and then you could fast forward again to the plains of Kibar when Ezekiel came out and saw the now it's defined as the glory of God uh, on the plain that appeared uh, to Ezekiel and he got a very uh, detailed description of what that was and uh, <clears throat> and then Jesus further defines it uh, when, he's, when he talks about, uh, they said, when are you going to restore the kingdom again to Israel? Luke 17, 21. And he changed the subject. They were looking for God's linear purpose through time. And uh, he changed the subject. He said, you need to quit thinking about God's linear purpose through time and think about the kingdom of God that's within you. He said in the last days they're going to be looking outward. Mm-hmm. But God but the trek, the angle of the the directional uh, uh, focus of this glory that first appeared to Abraham and now to Moses and then in the wilderness and then to Ezekiel and then visited Jesus and came on him when he was uh, baptized. The whole point of God was to bring that glory on the inside of you. The fire of God that appeared to Abraham, the fire of God that burned this bush, is the fire of God that's on the inside of you. Yeah. It's what Paul said, this is the mystery that's been hidden from dispensations and from ages, which we warn every man, which we teach every man, which we preach to every man. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. You have on the inside of you the burning uh, column of fire that ratified the sacrifice in Genesis 15 that, that told Moses, take off your shoes from off your feet. Yes. You know, why do we wear shoes? Uh, so that we can get past the rough spot. You know, but God wants us to be uh, vulnerable. In the New Testament it says, uh, see that you walk circumspectly in life. And that word circumspect, you look it up, it means barefoot. We need to learn to walk in vulnerability. To walk barefoot. And you know, it breaks my heart. Ministry doesn't get that today. Ministry wants to clothe themselves in the aura of invulnerability. They're trying to be head and shoulders above the rest. They're trying to be larger than life. And they're obscuring the glory because it's not about us. Paul said, we don't preach ourselves. Uh, we have this treasure in earth and vessels, and that means cracked pots. But in our, in our religious culture that we live in, if you show vulnerability... If you show humanity and weakness, uh, you're turned away from a people that are looking for a Saul rather than the Davids that God puts in their midst. But I'm here to tell you that the glory doesn't rest upon a King Saul. The glory doesn't rest upon that person who's who has contaminated his call with the cult of celebrity. Mm-hmm. 
but it rests upon that person who's walking in vulnerability, circumspect before his God. God wants you to feel. He told Moses to take his sandals off because he wanted Moses to feel everything. I like the guy, I can't remember who it was, uh, used to say that many times. He said, I, I want to have a religion that I can feel. I want to have an experience that I can feel. I want to know what it is for my emotions to be at the surface. And uh, to be able to respond. I appreciated that about, I grew up uh, in Pentecost. That was, and it was an other side of the tracks religion back then. It was poor folks religion. And the, these people were not intellectual and they were not educated. All they had was an emotional response to the Spirit of God. And they'd get up and run the aisles and run out of the building just to holler. And they wouldn't know what else to do. Without sharing who, uh, when we were in Switzerland... And I was in the middle of prophesying and breaking a curse. This brother was so overcome. He, he just burst out with emotion out of his mouth. It was like doubled him over in relief. Because the word of God will bring relief and it will bring release. And if it has to, I'm, I'm certain that he's had things bottled up on the inside. And it, it was just such an overwhelming breaker anointing that the man got free. And it was precious to watch. I will forever have that in my vision. I will have that uh, picture of what it's like to get set free. And uh, God just is so faithful to That was the same thing we saw word. in Barnard Castle when yes. God gave us the word over that yes. over northern England and over that area. Uh, it's just all bottled up on the inside of the people and they just spontaneously began to respond and, and the, the walls were ringing with the shouts as the people just responded with that from a place of vulnerability and just let the cry of their heart be made be made known. It was it was touching, it was heartbreaking. Our our hearts just were grafted to their hearts in that in that moment. And that was the moment of revival. If I could capture that, yeah. if I could bottle that and release that that to you, because I believe we, we laid hold upon something that God's wanting wanting to do and wanting to bring us to. We don't have to be sophisticated. We don't have to be uh, larger than life. We don't have to follow a concept of spiritual leadership that is contaminated by the cult of celebrity. We can uh, come to the place like David did. Just out there, David, what was David doing when they were trying to find the king? He was just watching his father's flocks. What was Moses doing? He was just out there trying to be responsible for what was in front of him. What are Kitty, it's what Kitty and I are doing. Uh, we didn't rush into this ministry. We sat for God drug us, not because we were reluctant, but because we wanted what God wanted for us. And we entered into what became Father's Heart Ministry because people told us, we know where you live. And you can pretend you're not at home, but we're coming to your house tonight and we want you to teach us. <laughs> and because people were hungry, responding to those needs. And uh, I believe there are many, many of you that are called. You have the call of God, the cry of God on the inside of you. And you have in you what Moses saw, the angel of the Lord that appeared in the bush. You have that burning on the inside of you. In that moment, when he was talking about that breakthrough moment, it's that moment when heaven kisses earth. And it's simply what, what the scriptures declare. Thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. And those are moments. So you might as well fasten your seatbelt and get ready for them because God's showing up. Just stay hungry. Do you want me to continue? Well, he's turned, he said he turned aside to see. And again, anything that makes you... Do a, double. do a double take. You need to pray to interpret. We need to learn to listen to the voice of God that uh, insinuates itself in all kinds of circumstance. When I wake up in the night, I'm listening. Amen. I listen. In the night when I'm dreaming, I'm listening. Always in the back of my mind, I'm reading, for lack of a better way to put it, I'm reading the tea leaves of my experience. I'm, I'm examining uh, every moment of experience, whether I'm sleeping or waking or coming awake in the night seasons, my, my response is always, when I wake up in the morning, speak, Lord, for that servant here. Uh, things that go on round about us, I want to know the voice of God. And Moses, I so appreciate uh, Moses' response. He could have closed his eyes. He could have looked at that and say, huh, isn't that strange? Now let me get these ticks out of this sheep in front of me. He could have ignored it, but he didn't. He was hungering. He was seeking. He was not accepting circumstances for the way they were. And uh, 
You know, Horeb means a desolate place that destroys you. Look up the word Horeb. <laughs> it means to destroy. It means a place of desolate, desolation, a place of dryness. And many of you uh, would say, that's my experience. I, I feel my life has been desolated. I feel like I'm all alone. You can be in the midst of a crowd. You can be attending the largest church in town, but you're dry and desolate, isolated. And uh, God told me in 1997 to reach out to people just like you and to say, you're not crazy, you're not backslid, and you're not alone. Amen. And they thought that Moses was crazy. They thought he had missed out on God. They thought he, he was alone and he could have died out there in that wilderness except that quality within him that was always doing what Kitty says, tracking the Holy Ghost. They're wanting to see what is God doing. I want to participate. I, you know, in my lifetime... I've been through years of isolation and dryness and tried. I've told God, I said, God, that's fine. I'll run this business till I, till I go to heaven, till I, till I die. If that's what it is, I can do that, God, not a problem. But what about this that you put on the inside Amen. of me? He put a fire. Amen. He put a calling. He put something within me that was designed to come to life and respond to the cry of the wild goose. To the cry of the Spirit of God Amen. in the land. And it's just like in Jesus' day when uh, the dove appeared and the voice of God. Some said uh, it was an angel. Some said, well, it just thundered. There wasn't nothing to it. But they didn't realize it was the cry of a father to his children. And what was he saying? You're going to have to come up higher. You're going to have to come out of your circumstance. He was calling Moses out from among those flocks. You have to be willing to relinquish your life as it is in order to embrace life as God intends it for you. Mm -hmm. He had something far different uh, for Moses. And uh, go ahead, honey. Verse 6. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the afflictions of my people which are in Egypt, and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. And I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of the land, unto a good land, and to a large, unto a land flowing with milk and honey, unto a place of the Canaanites, and the Hittites, and the Amorites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Now... Notice he's bringing them into a land flowing with milk and honey. These are all, we use these metaphors. We say, oh, I'm in a wilderness. Uh, I want to come to my Canaan land. We, these are all metaphors for spiritual experience. These were, this was a literal thing that happened, but these stories are so embedded in our, in our thinking that we describe uh, experiences in life using these uh, scenarios, using these scenes, these snapshots. And it's interesting, he wants to bring you into a land flowing with milk and honey. The Bible says to, des to desire the sincere milk of the word. But it's not just the milk of the word, the logos, which is the Bible that we're studying today. But it's also a desire, the honey. Honey is the prophetic word. Honey is the rhema word, the present truth that Peter talked about. The prophetess Deborah, her name means a bee. What do bees do? They produce honey. There are people out there, their attitude is what they call sola scriptura. The Bible and the Bible alone, we don't need anything else. Well, if we don't need anything else other than the Bible, then it was pointless for Jesus to give gifts to men in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. I'm here to tell you that the Bible's not enough. We need the gifts of God that the Bible testifies to. We need the experiences that the Bible testifies to. You need the prophetic word, the honey of God that comes through the prophetic ministry. It's a land flowing with milk and honey. And without both, you don't have a solid spiritual experience. Although it is true, the Bible says, despise not prophesying. And the Old Testament puts it this way. Too much honey makes you vomit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I know what it is to have all these prophecies about what a powerful ministry I was going to have. And I took all those prophecies and I just dropped them in the garbage can because I was tired. None of those things were delivering me out of the, the miserable here and now that I was in at the time. And uh, I, so I know why the Bible says despise not prophesying, but yet God kept, was so kind to me, he kept, it's like the movie, um, here we go talking about movies, The Count of Monte Cristo, where the, the prisoner tells the, 
this cellmate who was a fellow priest, he said, I don't even believe in God anymore. And the guy said, that's okay, God believes in you. I had a man come from uh, South Carolina driving through to Kansas City. He looked me up to tell me that very thing. Mm-hmm. He said, it's okay if you don't believe in your destiny anymore. God believes in you. Mm-hmm. And he took me, he drew me out of my difficult circumstances and put me in the very center of his will. Okay. Now therefore, verse 9, Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel is come unto me, and I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppress them. Come now, therefore, I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. And Moses said unto God, Who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh, and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? And he said, Certainly I will be with thee, and this shall be a token unto thee, that I have sent thee. When thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, ye shall serve God upon this mountain. So we all have to do our time on Horeb. Now you got to realize this mountain. You're going to serve God on this mountain. Isn't that wonderful? Well, Mount Horeb is a dry, desolate place of destruction. <laughs> and it seems like we all do time there. It's like we sing that song. It makes me chuckle. Uh, let's go up to Zion. Well, look up the word Zion. It means a dry, parched place. <laughs> but, it, but, but the positive meaning of it is, is it's a sunlit place. God is light. God is there. I have a lot of respect for the children of Israel because at one point God told them, y'all go on into Canaan land now and everything I ever promised you is going to come to pass with one exception, I'm not going with you. He, gave, he offered them everything they could ever expect God to do for them. He says, here it is, it's yours with one exception, I'm not going. And they, they cried out, they mourned. They fasted. They fell on their face before God. And, they, and Moses said, Lord, if you're not taking us, then take us not hence. If you're not going, we'd rather stay here in the wilderness. And you have to remember, those people, that entire generation, the Bible says, bleached their bones in the wilderness. Because they would have rather have perished in the wilderness with the presence of God than saw all of their dreams fulfilled without the presence of God. I have so much respect Mm -hmm. for those people. And uh, uh, go ahead. Verse 13, And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers hath sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? (laughs) And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent you unto me. I remember, if you remember when the soldiers came to take Jesus in one of the Gospels, and that they were inquiring if he was Jesus of Nazareth, and he answered, I am. And the soldiers all fell down. Yeah. Can you imagine? You know, a policeman comes to arrest you, or you so-and-so, <laughs> I am, and he falls out, he's slain, slain in the spirit. In the spirit. You know, and has the audacity to get up, put you in handcuffs, and carry you away. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's who, that is the inscrutable name of God that to this day I don't think we fully fathom what that, what that means. He is the I am. Am and that's who he is on the inside of you. Amen. He is the I am in you. He's not in a, a building, he's not in a box, he's not in an ark of the covenant like they carried through the wilderness. He's not in a temple or in a, uh, such as he was in the temple of Solomon. The whole purpose of God is to take what he uh, revealed in the burning bush and then put in the ark of the covenant and then put the ark of the covenant in the holy of holies. His whole point was to take that and put that on the inside of you. You are the ark of God's covenant. That's why when Jesus died, the veil in the temple was rent, uh, showing that the way into the holiness was made open, and also showing that the temple, was the Holy of Holies was empty. That the Spirit of God is now on the inside of us. That burning bush, the glory of God that led him through the wilderness, the glory of God that Ezekiel saw on the plain, it's not some outward thing anymore. We want to see something And Jesus wants you to witness something. We want to see something outward. He wants us to witness something inward. You have in you, Christ in you, Colossians 1, 26 and 27, uh, the hope of glory. And in that glory, he says, I'll meet all your needs. The glory met their needs in the wilderness. The glory met their needs in the Ark of the Covenant. The glory brought the captives out of captivity. But that glory is in you. And if you will listen to it, 
listen to him and, and respond to it and pray into it, it will meet your needs and bring breakthrough in your life. But you have to put your focus. You have to worship, like Solomon said, worship toward that place. And the truth is that when you are filled with him, like uh, the disciples were told to find a couple of replacements that were full of the Spirit of God, not half full, not three-quarter full, full of the Spirit of God, you won't help but manifest yourself, which is Christ. You'll be manifesting him, and you don't have to work that up. He just comes out natural. Verse 15, And God said moreover unto Moses, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, hath sent me unto you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations. Go, and gather the elders of Israel together, and say unto them, The Lord... God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, appeared unto me, saying, I have surely visited you, and seen that which is done to you in Egypt. And I have said, I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt, unto the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, unto the land flowing with milk and honey. And they shall hearken unto thy voice, and thou and thou shalt come, thou and the elders of Israel, unto the king of Egypt, and ye shall say unto him, The Lord God of the Hebrews hath met with us. Now let us go, we beseech thee, three days' journey into the wilderness, that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. It's interesting that he, he sent Moses to two different people. He sent him to the elders of the house of Israel in captivity, but he also sent him to Pharaoh. But let me tell you something. The elders were as difficult a group of people to approach as Pharaoh was. Because both the one thing that the elders of Israel and Pharaoh were in agreement about is they were not impressed with Moses. They did not want to... They saw, the elders saw Moses as a troublemaker. They saw Moses as somebody who was going to make things worse on them. They saw Moses as somebody who was going to be a problem. And you know, that's exactly how the elders in the Christian culture are today. You, you, go, you walk up to somebody and say, I'm called to be a prophet. Hi, God sent me to this church. I guarantee you they're not going to be handing you a visitor card. And I promise you they're going to have the assistant pastors and the security guards sitting just keep an eye on that guy because we don't know what he's, go, he's going to do. But I'm here to tell you that God knows how. God took Moses and he gave him signs, miracles, and wonders to convince the skeptics. And the skeptics, unfortunately, are those who sit in leadership because their attitude is, I've heard it all, I've seen it all, I don't want to hear it. We just want to learn how to maintain where we're at and get through and, and please God. And I understand that, but God is a God who brings visitation and deliverance. He never leaves us bound by the status quo. And uh, it took as much, if not more, convincing of Moses to convince the elders and the leaders of, of God's people than it did to convince uh, Pharaoh. The difference was God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Thank God he softened the hearts of the elders. Amen. And I believe God will soften the hearts of pastors. And he'll soften the hearts uh, of leaders in the church today. And cause them to begin to bear witness. Yes, it's true there will be many false prophets in the last days. But the only reason why that's a strategy of the enemy is because there are many true prophets in the earth today. And their message is... Let my people go to come out of the contaminated culture of, of this world that we live in into responding to the cry of God in the earth. To come together as a people and see a visitation that is yet without parallel in the earth that I think is available. I think it's right upon us. Amen. Verse 19, And I am sure that the king of Egypt will not let you go, no, not by the, a mighty hand, and I will stretch out my hand and smite Egypt with all my wonders which I will do in the midst thereof. And after that he will let you go. And I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. And it shall come to pass that when you go out you shall not go empty. But every woman shall borrow of her neighbor and of, and of her that sojourneth in her house jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment and ye shall put them on your sons and upon your daughters and ye shall spoil the Egyptians it's interesting to me when you talk about what kind of signs miracles and wonders is it going to take to get the attention of the world well let me tell you about a sign and a wonder that is probably the most significant miracle I have seen in our generation that was only a footnote in a news broadcast. 
when the oil spill happened, the Deep Horizon oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico, and it pumped out millions of barrels. I say millions, maybe, let's say, I don't know how much it was, but I know it was a lot. Huge. It was an untold amount of oil. Ginormous. And they talked about the devastation that that was going to bring into the Gulf of Mexico, which is this very significant waters uh, that would ultimately affect uh, seas far and wide here in the world. And the, the ecologists were saying how terrible and how awful this was and how will we ever solve this. And it's going to destroy marine life and it's going to be such a horrible, devastating thing. And then after they got the well capped and they began to measure uh, the... They were looking for the dead zones, and they were looking for the, the, the problems, and they began to search where they thought they would find the oil, and they could not find it. And it came out on the news and it's saying, it's the disappearing oil, where is all the oil? And they couldn't find it, they haven't found it to this day. Because it's just like the prophet when there was poison in the pot at the school of the prophets, and the prophet cast in the meal, and the, and the pot of... Uh, the. Porridge. The pot of porridge was healed. Uh, God, I know people were praying. We were praying. And I know that, that God healed the waters of the Gulf of Mexico. Mm -hmm. And the oil disappeared. And they say, and they came out, the scientists had all kinds of really uh, natural explanations. Well, this is what happened to it. Well, these are the same guys that said that it would be uh, that it would turn the entire Gulf of Mexico into an oil slick that would contaminate the entire seven seas, and now all of a sudden they just have this marginal explanation because they did not know how or why or what happened to those waters, but it was God yes. manifesting His power on a global scale, and I'm here to tell you that God is is there's a cry in the in the earth today as let my people go. You know, and whenever the world sees that you want to be financially free, you want to be free in your life, well, they start laying you off. They say consumer confidence is low. And they say, okay, make payments without jobs. And all of a sudden, unemployment is rampant because you're trying to get free. When people start putting more money in savings uh, than they are out there spending on conspicuous consumption of consumer goods, well, then they start laying you off so that they make the, the population pull money out of savings and begin to spend it again upon the, the things that that keep the economy afloat. And so the spirit of Pharaoh is alive and well today. You try to you try to get free, and we try to get free as a people, and say, that's okay, just make payments without jobs. We know how to get your money. <laughs> and it's Pharaoh saying, you will not be free. But God is saying, let my people go to come out of the bondage and the carnality of... Huh? That they may serve me. That they may serve me. <laughs> that we can come out three days uh, wilderness that you might sacrifice to your God. Uh, there's a cry in the earth today. People think that things are just getting worse and worse and worse. Well, we've seen this before. You go back before the Great Awakening uh, in the 1700s and before and see the spiritual condition of the Western world was very dark and very immoral. And then God brought revival. And it can happen again. I'm not concerned about the darkness we see because I know God is a delivering God. He'll deliver us as a people and deliver us as a culture. The key for you is not to look at the gross darkness that Zechariah talks about, but look at the morning spread on the mountains. Um, the sky isn't falling. The kingdom is coming. When Moses showed up, the elders in Israel, it was just bad news to them. He looked like, he looked like trouble looking, going somewhere to happen. They didn't know what was going to come of, of Moses, but they knew whatever it was, it would meant bad news for them because they were looking at the gross darkness. They were looking at the difficulty, but that was not God's plan. God has a plan of deliverance for, for you as an individual and for his people. It's a new day. It's a new day. It's a day, the Bible tells us plainly, of revival and outpouring of my spirit. And guess what? He said, oh, your sons and your daughters... The great Pentecostal scripture in Joel 2. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. He didn't even say speak in tongues. We call Pentecost from speaking in tongues. No, he said they're going to prophesy. On my handmaidens, I'm going to pour out my spirit. And he's pouring out his spirit even today. We're in the, we're in the offing. We're in the opening of that revival. We're in a part of it and it hasn't waned yet. And I just want to encourage you. To expect good things. I'm excited to study the book of Exodus. Because I think it speaks 
directly to our day. Because Jesus is to us what Moses was to those people. And he's in our midst. Just like Moses was in their midst and he was stirring things up. <laughs> Jesus is in our midst and he's stirring things up. And we can get ready for good things that God's doing in the earth. So, Father, just as you are confirming this message this morning with uh, outside, we have thunderings and we have lightnings and we have rain. We thank you for the rain of your spirit. And I pray, we pray for a fresh rain upon those that are listening, including our own lives, that the outpouring of your spirit, Father, something new starts today with an impartation and a manifestation of yourself in every sector of uh, humanity, everywhere where these people are, every country. And we know you're on foreign soil, some of you, and some of you on U.S. soil. But we thank you, Father, for a fresh awakening, a fresh outpouring. Let us be part of a solution solution to to disallow the pollution in the earth and we bless you and we honor you for every good and perfect gift that comes comes from you our heavenly father and we bless these people in jesus christ's name amen amen god bless you we'll see you tomorrow